Before filmmaking, I was 15. I started when I was 16. I knew nothing about anything. I just wanted to be a rock guitarist. And... Okay, so let's start down here with some of the best. Stalka, the trip on the tram car is probably some of the best I've ever seen at all times. It's so present and the sound of this and the visions of this is so magic. And it's so much about what we don't see and it's so close to these characters and still a huge landscape. And it's a way of making sound that almost no one does anymore. And his transition from black and white into color is very simple, but it works for me. So we start with the best. Yeah. <laughs> well, with some of the best. This film, Fanny and Alexandre, is probably my main inspiration of all films. The first half, which is uh, the celebratory part, which a lot is a lot around a, a table, and going into the rooms, Christmas in Stockholm. It was my main inspiration, or one of my main inspirations for uh, my first film here in France, uh, Festen. <laughs> I actually stole a scene from here. There's a scene where they run around in the house in uh, celebration. And when I had a conversation with uh, Bergman, who claimed that Festen was a masterpiece, I was very proud of that. He, uh, I said, I'm sorry, I stole your scene. <laughs> And uh, he said, oh, oh, it doesn't matter. I stole it from uh, the leopard from uh, Visconti. <laughs> so don't, don't mind. So uh, that was fine. The way uh, this family looks like a family that has al always existed, the way they're sending me back to their past all the time, the way that this looks like something, a Christmas Eve that would have appeared even though the camera wasn't there. It's mesmerizing to me. The second half, or the, 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 the rest of it, is, is a bit more bleak, but this celebratory part in the beginning keeps coming back to me. Anyway, this was a little anecdote. Let's talk about these movies. So when I went to film school, uh, Lars von Trier was making these movies. Uh, one of the great inspirations as a filmmaker is to see when your idols see the bad movies they've done. <laughs> and I, at that time at film school, I saw the work that von Trier did when he started film school, which like all of us was less great. And then he had a Tarkovs Tarkovsky seminar. Then he saw all these movies. And then his, his masterpiece Nocturne, which was a midterm movie. Out of that arrived the element of crime. What is your name? You can call me Harry. My name's Kim. Obviously, Lars has been stri stricken by... I don't know if he would agree on that. <laughs> this is my conclusion. And he would probably be very annoyed if I, he heard me say all this. Epidemic, you know, was Lars's first finger to the world. It was made with no money and it showed showed me a side of Lars, which I love dearly, which is his humor. Probably these are my, these and The Kingdom, which is a TV series, are my favorite Lars von Trier works. Maybe because I saw them before I understood his recipe. So I sort of lost my innocence with Lars von Trier. So I'm, I'm less patient with his later works. These, uh, these hit me hard. But then there's Joachim Trier. Uh, they're not family related. But this particular film and his first film as well were films that uh, I've picked because they are new films and were very inspirational. I think there's a great sensibility in how he uses the camera. His curiosity towards this, this friend of his, who's actually, I think, a doctor in real life, is very dignified and interesting and makes me really curious. And I think this movie is extraordinary. This movie, 
with Chirac, Departieu. I love to see Storaro's Im images. They really get to me. I had a dinner with uh, Dira, Girard Departieu in uh, Lyon, and he was eating a lot, and he had a, a cut-off shirt, and I could, you know, push here. And I remember the waiter coming over and saying, don't smell it, just eat it. It was really, it was intestines. And he was such a lovable person, and he was eating his wife's food and my food, and everybody was like, next to him, I was a, an innocent little child, right? So I said, Mr. Departieu, I loved the way you were so open and so curious and so present in, um, in 1900. And he said, eh, yeah, it's because I don't know when my line, I don't know when my line, so I look all over to see when my line. <laughs> uh, I said, okay, so that's the recipe. <laughs> we'll come to France later, but don't look now, it's over here. This for me is a masterpiece. Obviously, Nick Rogue introduced to me time in film because he's, um, he's inducing an element of time that I wasn't used to in his editing. We should go. Ah. famous love scene or sex scene with you know the most beautiful woman on earth Julie Christie so full of uh, grief and so full of uh, love between adults it's not like a puberty uh, aggressive sex scene it's a natural sex scene which shows repetition and sex and uh, it's cut together between their sex and then brushing, brushing to tooth and and I, I feel their life there in a sad ironic way it has an echo into my life right now, uh, as I lost my daughter uh, recently. This is the film that I enlightened me uh, when I was young, but has become even more relevant uh, in, in the life I have right now. So, French. Uh, French. On the first day of film school, they showed me La Nuit Américaine. <laughs> And that, that was clever because it sort of makes you fall in love with what, with what happens behind the camera. You have to know that in, in Denmark, in the 70s where I grew up, everything French meant something luxurious. When you went to a, a grocery store, uh, they would sell French soap and it would be much more expensive than any, anything else because it was from France. And it's with this background I entered the Danish film school and when they showed me the first French film, it was this one, I felt welcomed into a fantastical world of opportunities and beautiful women and crazy problems. The world of filmmaking. Uh, Godard is, you know, I still, when I talk to my cinematographer about how, what, what to do with our next movie, like what to do with Drunk, we watch Godard scenes. We don't watch entire Godard movies. We watch sequences for some reason. His strength in his mise-en-scene and his playing with it in, in such a naive way is really talking to me. The naive, unmanipulative, upfront playfulness of uh, Godard is of a constant inspiration. Why do you want to sleep with me? Because I would like to know there is something in you that I like and I don't know what. What did I pick here? Well, we've talked about that one. Here's Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. What we have to mention is that Bob Dylan made the music and uh, it's a super vulgar movie. It's got some very sleazy slow motion of cowboys being killed and with Bob Dylan music on it. Ah! It's a film that I keep returning to because it's got so much uh, testosterone. And then um, it has a score, which I've been putting on many of my movies. I can't afford it, so I always have to do something else. But uh, while editing, this score has been on many of my movies. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Let's talk about Dr. Strange. So in this movie, which I didn't finish, I hear is great, 
but it's just not my kind of movie. But there's a, a, an actor who's very much my kind of actor. There's a, Mads Mikkelsen. There is no such thing as best in acting, but if there was, he would probably be on the top somewhere. He's an extraordinarily great actor, and he can go all the way from here to the film that I did, with, with, which, which I think is a contradiction to this, The Hunt. Encore une masterpiece. Well, this is uh, originally called Badlands. It was my introduction to uh, Terence Malick, who, besides from knowing a lot about birds, is a fantastic filmmaker. Days of Heaven. This film, for me, is the most beautiful painting. It's, it's Nestor Almendros doing masterly photography. It's shot over, I think, six months. They insisted on only shooting in downgoing or upgoing light, low light. So they never shot in the middle of the day. The best photography, cinematography ever. And that's his two first movie. Yeah. Well, there's this thing when you start making movies, there's some spontaneity and there's some, we call it butterfly dust in Denmark. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's Gomo. Let's talk about Gomo. I'm a huge admirer of Harmony Korine as a person. He was one of the Dogma brothers. His own works are, you know, full of heart and full of cynicism. Oh, you wish me well, you couldn't tell. I, I can tell you a great story. We had, we formed a group, Lars von Trier and I, back in the 90s called uh, Dogma 95. Actually, I initiated a session amongst the, the Dogma Brotherhood, which I called Confessions. We had to confess what we did wrong, what, what, what was breach of the rule. Harmony flew to Copenhagen. There's a pregnant woman in his uh, Dogma movie. And he said, I tried and I tried for months. I banged her up and down, but she never got pregnant. So there's a pillow under her shirt. I'm sorry, this is my confession. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Husbands <clears throat> is a very interesting film. Both John Cassavetes as a person. I find him one of the most beautiful men who've ever existed. What he did was also so great. He's one of my heroes. He's a role model. There are certain indications I looked into your eyes, I saw it right away. Leo. <laughs> and the reason I picked Husbands now is because I made a movie about drunk men. And obviously he did too. And obviously we looked at this movie as well. It's a very interesting film to see again. Because the first time I saw it, it, it was just a great film. But now times have changed. I thought the whole... Me Too uh, gender debate was only something that happened in the world while I was watching it. But then I watched this movie and I was offended by it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, breaches of innocent women in all ages. And it showed me a testimony of a time which no longer exists. Well, uh, in the same way I was fascinated with Scorsese, uh, French Connection was was just a film I kept watching. Get your hands on your heads. Get off the bar and get on the wall. Come on, move, move. You know, Gene Hackman, I think, is a miracle. He's a bit of a, a, f a role model for the characters that I've made with Thomas Bolasen, the violent brother of, uh, of Celebration. But there's another guy who's that as well. Speaking of which, The Godfather. Probably the most unoriginal choice. I could come with in a shop like this, full of cinephiles, but probably still the film that have affected me the most. I did a film back in the 90s called Festen. Uh, we were inspired by Bergman, but the gallery of characters was is stolen from The Godfather. You know, Festen was about limitations. We made Ten Commandments that stripped away a lot of possibilities. Camera had to be handheld. We couldn't add any props, we couldn't add any makeup, no music, and it all became very playful. Limitations are historically liberating. In Godfather 2, they had a limitation, they had a problem, a classic film problem. Mr. Brando wanted too much money to make number two. And there was a birthday scene where they celebrate Marlon Brando's birthday, but they couldn't afford him. 
He writes a scene, which is uh, one of the best scenes I've seen, where they all wait for him. And Al Pacino tells James Caan that he's enlisted in the army. And James Caan get, gets crazy and violent. And then they all run to the corridor and sing a birthday song. <laughs> For Marlon Brando, who wasn't there. And we stay in a close-up of Al Pacino. And it describes really well the world of filmmaking. How to turn your problems into an advantage. That's more or less all we do all the time. Voila. Yeah. <laughs>